Welcome to another edition of A Voice to the Gentile Church. I'm Jim Wingerter. Next to me is Pastor Roger Diaz. Next to him is Dolores Lowe. So you've got a multitude of issues we can yes. look at, current events. Yes, and it's it's actually, it was today was depressing covering current events because there's so much craziness. Right? This is like an unprecedented election year, right? It's normally crazy. This is over the top crazy. So it appears that this week, the topic of discussion for both campaigns was religion, right? So whereas Donald Trump came out and he said that the U.S. needs to get back to having more religion because religion um, creates guardrails for people um, and how important it is, how much better they behave when they adhere to religion and, you know, all the niceties of religion, right? He said it's a guide. You want to be good people and without religion, there are no guardrails, right? So... Yeah. Sounds pretty normal, right? Yeah. So then we go over to the Harris campaign. She decided to hire a new religious advisor, the Reverend Jennifer Butler. She is a Presbyterian pastor, right? Uh, reverend. Reverend. Um, and in 2020, she wrote, wrote a book called Who Stole My Bible? And she's way out there. She says that our Christian faith, most fundamentalist Christian faith are a threat to democracy. Um, it is the many-headed beast which reveal the corruption of the imperial system around us. So all these things that <laughs> um, you would not expect a reverend to um, mm. adhere Otherwise, to. she's fine. Otherwise, she's fine, right? <laughs> so... You can see how both campaigns are now treating religion, right? Yeah, yeah. We know that Christians are being targeted in the U.S. by the FBI and the CIA, and we're, you know, Christian fundamentalists or horrible people. And now the Harris campaign decided they needed a veneer of Christianity, so they went and found some far-left loony, super liberal, to put her in. Well, no, it's, it's all a facade anyway. It's, none of it is real. Exactly. It's smoke and mirrors. Yep. And then another misstep for the Harris campaign was, so we had the anniversary of the Abbey Gate death in Afghanistan where we lost 12 yeah. um, service members. Um, the Gold Star families invited both Trump and Harris to come to Arlington National Ceremony. She denies it. She, the families came out, all the families together, video, they all said it. They all said, we invited her, and she was in her home, which... Four miles away. Yes, really close yeah. by, right? So then, <laughs> when, when video first came out of Donald Trump at Arlington doing the ceremony and all that, Kamala Harris, in, in the most ironic thing, comes out on X claiming that Donald Trump had politicized the whole thing. In actuality, politicizing the whole thing, right? <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah, right. she's the one that did the politicizing, right? For sure. Yeah. So, well, I, I, we all know that this, this, this argument is ridiculous. Um, Biden, not too long ago, had a photo op at the same, at yes. the exact same yes. spot. Uh, so uh, they're just grappling at whatever. Yep. So, and McCain there was some sort of a dispute there, and it became a, a, a major event. You know, I, I even heard one liberal say that Trump should be charged for this. Yep, yep, yeah. Isn't that something? They're, they're, they're way out there. They're I mean, just bunkers. Yep, they're bunkers. <laughs> they're trying to find any way to poke the bear, right, to get I think in Monty there. Python would have done a really good job with this with this situation today. Do you I think, think Monty today is, is, is watching <laughs> yes. and drooling on himself yes. <laughs> that everything that he God, prophesied so has come to be. Well, is so bizarre. Well, speaking of bizarre and Monty Python, great segue. Tim Walsh's family came out <laughs> today <laughs> and um, endorsed Donald Trump. And they put a beautiful photo of the family wearing Walsh's for Trump 2024 t-shirts. Oh, my God. <laughs> and Walsh's brother said that Tim Walsh is not 
a person you want making life decisions for you. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it just, the irony in this whole thing, the craziness going on in this election, it's just nuts. You remember Al Jaffe and Mad Magazine, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. This whole political <laughs> environment can make a really good issue of Mad Magazine, I think. I can just see, I can see some of the, uh, the, the, the artist renderings, the, the cartoons that they would put out. It's crazy, but you know, of course, the media and even, I guess, uh, is Al Jaffe still alive? Probably not. Probably not. Uh, but there's still issue in uh, Mad Magazines out there. Yeah. But the funny, the, the funny thing is I was reading the, con so I read the, the news article, right? And then I'm reading the comments. And the first comment is some liberal going, is this really his family or is it some distant relative? I'm like. Kinfolk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one is his brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's such desperation, uh, such, you know, the, 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 the liberals are panicked. Yep. They're absolutely, absolutely panicked. Um, and, yeah. Yep. And they then, have to put on a good face, but they are panicked. Yeah. I saw an interview with um, the same woman who interviewed, what's her name? Uh, Dana Bash. Dana Bash, right. Mm -hmm. Interviewing. Um, J.D. Vance. Tulsi. Oh, Tulsi. Tulsi Gabbard. Did she treat her nice? Because she didn't treat J.D. Oh, Vance. She nice. had no choice with Tulsi. Oh. Tulsi was just you know, laying down the facts and, uh, and and Dana had no choice but to, but she kept the, she kept the, the, the line going, right? She, she mm -hmm. kept trying to make the whole Arlington thing a, a violation, but Tulsi Gabbard treated her pretty handily. Well, I think the Trump campaign should put Tulsi Gabbard out there more. I think so. Because think so when it's sure. Trump She's so against, powerful. She's yeah, so, she's powerful and she's a woman. So you want a woman against a woman. You don't want Trump doing it because then right. he looks like he's beating up. Chauvinist yeah. pig. Yeah. Right. I so wanted Tulsi to be uh, his VP pick. So wanted that, but it didn't happen. Oh, you got to have a VP pick who can. So I believe the reason he picked J.D. Vance is because J.D. Vance is in his 40s. Mm -hmm. so, he's, so is Tulsi. Yes, but J.D. Vance is a Republican. And when the. When. Trump is out of the picture. You need a Republican that can keep the Republican Party going, the new Republican Party, right? Not not the deep state that we've had for so many years. I, I would have, I would have, I would have been really happy with Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah. So what if she's uh, no independent? I mean, you know. So. Yeah. So in um, so Sunday we were talking about the debate. Uh huh. And. How we over can't a, over a soggy pizza, right? Over over a soggy pizza. <laughs> <laughs> <And> Yum. <laughs> we were trying to figure out how Kamala Kamala was going to engineer herself out of this debate. Mm -hmm. She she wanted an open mic so that when Trump tried to interrupt her, she could do her little line of "Excuse me, I'm speaking," right? Thus making it seem like Trump was beating up on her, right? Or being, overriding her or overriding her or being a you know chauvinist pig or all that she stuff. wanted that cool takedown exactly but she, but she, it's, it's ridiculous though because you think trump would have fall for that i don't know i can just i can just imagine trump's responses yeah. to her but i mean right off the bat he would say something to the effect you're speaking but you're saying nothing <laughs> You know, maybe he would say something like that, that because true. that's the truth. That is true. You're speaking yeah. word salads. Yes. You know, probably he'd say something like that to her. Well, she Pence, didn't get Pence, her way though. Pence wasn't the right guy to deal with her. No, no, no. Um, so she did not get her way no. when her campaign tried to change all the rules. Um, ABC said no. The rules are the rules, and they're staying in place. So yeah. she's got to find a way to get out of this. I believe this is step number one. All of a sudden. The Disney rates with DirecTV ended September 1st. DirecTV and Disney are now under negotiations. ABC, ESPN are all owned by Disney. So right now, if you are a DirecTV client, you cannot get ABC or ESPN. So you will not be able to watch the debate, right? It, it'll, and in speaking with DirecTV today, they said, oh, we're so far apart, this isn't going to be resolved anytime soon. Because people were saying, well, what about the debates? You know, people need to see the debates. And they're like, no, we're, we're too far apart. Is it? So at least a yeah. good, you know, several million people will not be able to watch the debate. And yes, I agree with you, there would be. Yeah. 
X social media. Right, exactly. Um, but they'll find something else. They're just chipping away right now. They just got to get there, right? They're, mm. they're still working it. And then this I is... I agree with you, though. They're, they are desperate. They're seeing a, a rapid decline in her favor, favor mm -hmm. you know, in her favor. Uh, I, think, I think there's nothing they can do for her. Yeah. I think she's just going to continue to decline. I, I think so also. And then in a horrible I told you so, the state of Oregon for years decriminalized drugs, right? Oregon's one of those states where you could go to the corner and buy whatever drug you wanted and use it on the street and nobody cared. This week, the state of Oregon has decided to recriminalize drugs because they have lost an entire generation of people to drugs. Yeah. And it's stupidity, liberal right. stupidity, right? I visited Oregon <clears throat> in the early 1980s and it's like everybody was smoking dope. Mm -hmm. Well, then they decriminalized everything else, right? So fentanyl, right. you know, cocaine, heroin, you name it. I mean, they have, they have um, bins on the street where you can drop your needles after you've done your heroin. Like, like people who've done heroin are going to drop their needles in a bin, right? Because they're already high. Who cares, yeah. right? So it, it's just a shame that you've lost a whole generation. Right. Going back to that religion and laws are good guardrails in life because human beings are fallen people. Um, okay, and then moving over to Israel and the Middle East, the IDF discovered subway tracks in the tunnels in northern Gaza, right? So where did the money for these subway tracks come from? Gosh. You, you know, the Europeans, mm -hmm. you know, our yep. country. Yep. And unfortunately, we have seen the response with the hostages that were killed, right? So last week, we had the hostage that was saved, right? The Muslim Bedouin that we found alive and was saved. And then this week, we had the six hostages that were killed. And very you could say murdered yes murdered that thank you yeah. and the response worldwide has been horrendous right yeah. rather than blame Hamas they're blaming Israel and they want to force Israel to come to the table for a ceasefire the disturbing part is the Israelis in Israel are doing that too yes there is a group that um, so there, there was a bunch that went out into the streets on strike and all that stuff and um, the good news is the Israeli Supreme Court said they didn't have a right to strike. So that at least, which the Israeli Supreme Court is not known for being conservative, right? No, they're, they're no, always they're, liberal, it's right? crazy how yeah. liberal they are. Yeah, so it's, it's a shame, but it, the UK response was to ban selling arms to Israel. The Biden administration is claiming that Israel needs to come to the negotiating table. Never mind that Hamas is not coming to the negotiating table. I mean, right. how can you negotiate a ceasefire with no one on the other right. side, right? right. Well, they're expecting Israel to declare defeat and to fully capitulate. That's what they want. That's what they want, and yes. And give Hamas the victory. Mm -hmm. So it is, it, is, it is very upsetting, especially these fools on college campuses that are still protesting, right? So if you ask them... What does from the river to the sea mean? They don't know. They don't know what river. They don't know what sea. Today, Facebook came out and said that they wouldn't ban that phrase from Facebook because there's, you know, you know how Facebook bans everything we post, right? Right. Yeah, everything's got that. that Stupid thing. Yes. Well, from, they're not going to ban from the river to the sea because they don't view it as calling for genocide of Israel, right? Which everybody knows it. It's even in Hamas's charter, right? Yeah. So... The world continues with their insanity. Let's see. That that situation with the four young people that were that were uh, murdered, um, it's particularly grievous. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly grievous. They were they were alive moments before they were they were to be rescued, and it just shows the sh the sheer murderousness of Hamas. Hamas mm -hmm. lives up to right. their name. Yep. Hamas, of course, means violence. violence. Yes. 
and they're living up to their names. Hamas, how could you want peace if that's what you're going to do? Uh, you know, you're going to do this just sort of spitefully. Yeah. So right. It's it's uh, and then release videos of them, you know, having these these same six young people speak to the Israeli people. Um, the Israeli authorities are not mm -hmm. releasing the full video because, you know, Hamas did some really horrible things. Yep. Uh, Hamas made a statement, mm -hmm. and they said that that their guards are instructed that if they're going to be rescued, to execute all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Execution. How do you, you negotiate with I that? I know you can't. You know, they're, they're executing uh, innocent people, young people, innocent people. And doing it in a way as to to mentally uh, affect the Israeli people, and it seems to be succeeding, but it's nearly it's, it's really not succeeding to the extent that it appears. Most Israelis, uh, you know, grieved over it, uh, wish it wouldn't happen, but they're not in a position to capitulate. They're 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 holding ground, saying we must we must get rid of Hamas. We we mm -hmm. have to get rid of Hamas. Yeah, I was listening to Tucker Carlson earlier this week, and he had somebody on his show, Mike Welts, and Wells, with an E. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Another kinfolk. <laughs> yeah. And um, he was doing the, we shouldn't be in Ukraine, we shouldn't be in Israel, and doing the equality thing, right? And it, I was disappointed in Tucker Carlson not coming back and saying, okay, Israel is an existential threat, right? It's not whether... Hamas is going to come in and take over or not, it is Hamas is going to come in and kill everyone. Whereas the Ukraine, Russia would come in and institute a new government. They're not going to kill everybody in the Ukraine, right? right? But anyone who's astute and been paying attention to what's been happening with the globalists over the last 20 years will know that that Russia was drab, well mm -hmm. lured yep. into this into conflict the with, and that yep. the globalists purposely use Ukraine yes. as bait to bring Russia, in, Russia yeah. into it. Yeah, the, the whole Ukrainian um, plan that the U.S. has laid out started way back yeah. right after, during the Clinton administration. That's Absolutely. When it it's it's a, one, of, one yeah. of the, the globalist agendas to, 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 um, to, to, to weaken Russia mm -hmm. and to use Ukraine to do it. The, their plan is going uh, as as planned. Everything's going according to their plan. Well, speaking of that, this week Brazil mm. banned X because they wanted, get this, they wanted X to ban free speech. They wanted to, there are actually senators of the Brazilian Congress and representatives that they did not want being able to post to X. And when Elon Musk refused because he said he was a free speech platform, they banned it. So <laughs> that is that comes on the heels this week of Brazil arresting opposition candidates. Okay. Oh, right? right. But that's Bolsonaro? They, they arrested Bolsonaro? They, they've arrested a bunch of, of his people, right? Oh, and I think they have him under house arrest. But that is comes out of the U.S. State Department's playbook. Oh, yeah. yeah. The first thing that we do when a new government is installed is we get that government to get rid of the opposition so that there isn't any dissent and the government can grow, right? So this whole thing is being orchestrated by the U.S. government. Similarly, last two they weeks ago, <coughs> Dorof Pavel who is a French citizen of Russian descent and owns Telegram, which is a European version of Instagram, right? He got arrested because he refused to uh, moderate speech on his platform. In reality, what's going on there is that the Ukrainians had been using Telegram, don't ask me why, to communicate their plans. And the Russians had insight into it, so the Russians were had we're seeing the Iranians' military plans, I mean, the, the Ukrainians' military plans as they, before they were being executed, right? So they were being better prepared. So this whole thing became an excuse to arrest Dorof Pavel and take Telegram off the air. So, I mean, it, it's, it's been a very depressing week reading the news because so all no this crazy news. stuff is going on. No good news. I feel so bad for... 
Dale, because he loves his good news. But there is one more story that I have to cover because this one actually made me want to throw up. Mm, that bad. It's that bad. So the UN is negotiating a new treaty like they always are, right? L the treaty for children, for you know, pandemics, whatever. And in this treaty, the issue of pedophilia came up. Mm. And you would think that this was a subject matter that we could all agree on. We could all agree that child pornography is wrong, right? Seems reasonable. The U.S. and the EU don't seem to agree on that. The U.S. and the EU want exceptions to the criminalization of child pornography. That includes AI-generated child pornography, child pornography that was done with consent. Don't ask me how a child could consent to pornography. Well, it's parental consent. We call that child abuse, right? Right, right. And they also want, so in, for example, in Germany, a 14-year-old can supposedly consent to sex with an adult. So they also wanted that. And I'm telling you, I remember being a 14-year-old girl. I wouldn't know anything. I wouldn't know enough, right? Right, right. So I, I find it, it really made me want to throw up to think that our government would be in support of stuff like that. And what did the UN have to do with that? The, the UN was the platform? Yeah, there, it's, the, it's an international treaty between Western nations and the European Union. Okay. Call, um, and they said that they want exceptions to porn that does not involve a real child or is AI generated or created within a consensual relationship or kept for private use. Why is that all right? I don't know. That should not be all right. And so the U.S. and the EU are collaborating on this? Yeah, they're the ones. So the U.N. treaty would ban all that, would criminalize it. The mm -hmm. U.S. and the EU are against criminalizing it. They want to make it legal. That's amazing. It is. It is. It is just. Well, enough bad news. <laughs> yep. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. It's all right. <laughs> and we do have a good question. You, all right. you said in your last podcast that God's favor has returned to Israel. <laughs> you never know what somebody's going to pull out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Please give future definition to this point, especially in light of the current situation in Israel. <laughs> I typed that badly. It was supposed to be further, but that's okay. Further definition, not future definition. All right. Okay. So, yeah, this question came to me, and it basically challenged the idea that God's favor has returned to Israel. How can that be because we're seeing such... Uh, carnage and such, you know, desperation and mayhem in Israel. All right, so it's a fair question. So we'll just we we'll just look at it. So uh, just uh, just 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 to be clear. Oh my! I can't believe I said that. Strike that. I don't ever <laughs> want to use that phrase again. Uh, we want to be want to be direct about this. Um, yeah, things are things are difficult. Things are difficult in Israel right now. Um, we don't like what we're seeing. It doesn't play into the overall concept of God's favor returned to Israel. But we have to look into what that means, that God's favor has returned to Israel. We have to, 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 to see what it's really uh, pointing to. First of all, the, the, the process of the restoration, the restoration of Israel, that the Bible points to, that the prophets spoke of, that Moses pointed to at Mount Sinai and at Mount Nebo 40 years later, this restoration process is not complete. All right? So it's, it's, it's in the process of being, being complete. It's not there yet. But certainly we can see the momentum, the direction that it's going to that place where ultimately this restoration would be complete. And so we've talked about the analogy of Jacob, the son of Isaac, who went out to Mesopotamia, he went out for 20 years, and he returned to the land of Israel, and how he went through a complete, uh, sort of a born-again experience, a, yeah. transfor a, transform a transformation uh, occurred in his life. 
but it was it was not immediate it became immediate at the jordan when he encountered the the the, the angel or, or god who he struggled with from that point on it was it was complete but leading up to it there was a struggle a real struggle you know to stand to 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 get away from Laban, to get away from his sons uh to 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 worry about Esau. So there was a, a struggle all the way up to that pivotal moment when he became Israel. So the alleg the allegory does relate to Israel today. Israel today is like Jacob, returning. The the process is not complete. And so today Israel is dealing with all the struggles. They Laban, his sons, uh, you know, Esau, all of the potential issues that 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 they're dealing with is like Jacob approaching the Jabbok where the Jabbok meets the Jordan. Metaphorically speaking, that's where Israel is ultimately going to have that full, complete turnaround experience. So the, the the restoration is not complete. So yes, we're going to see things that we don't want to see. We're going to see struggles that we don't like. But this 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 struggle that we're seeing today with Israel is by 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 all standards the worst that has that has come into existence since the modern state of Israel. Mm -hmm. They they haven't experienced anything like this, and and that's that's fine. I mean, they they they're fighting for their existence. It's it's an existential war. Now all of that is true. Let's talk about the restoration process. The restoration process really began in earnest around the early 1500s. That's when, for the first time since 70 AD, Jews began to be allowed by an imperial order, the Ottoman Empire, to return to the land of Israel. Prior to that, you had the Roman, the Byzantine, the Mamluks. Um, they were not allowed. They were prohibited until the Byzantine. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, Ottoman Empire with the Sultan Suleiman. He was the one who said, okay, and we all know the story of mm -hmm. Dona Garcia Mendez. Yes. She dealt with the, the Suleiman, with, with the Sultan, and it was because of her work with the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire that Jews were literally encouraged to come into the land of Israel. That happened in the early 1500s. So it happened very slowly, meat meat, and it built, and it built. Uh, before the end of the 1500s, you had Tiberias, you had, you had Asfed, you had Jerusalem, where Jewish communities began to, to grow in strength. In the 1600s, 1700s, you had Hebron and other communities in the Galilee and so on, where, where Jewish life began to blossom. 1800s, they were draining the swamps, and the land was beginning to show signs of the restoration. So, it's a process, in other words. Now, this process has really built in momentum to where we are today, but it's not complete. There's some important things that has to happen in order for that process to take that quantum leap forward. And we're seeing the things. This struggle is an essential struggle. Yes, it is an existential struggle, but it's essential for them to go through this. Again, it's, it's Jacob at the Jabbok. He had to come down to that place, at that place where he would confront who he was. All right, and have this great struggle within himself and with God, and he overcame. So this is where Israel is today. So let's talk about what the Bible says concerning the time that we're in. What did God promise Israel? What did God say to Israel at, at Sinai? He spoke to Israel at Sinai and Nebo, and at Mount Nebo, concerning this very issue, the issue of their, their restoration. So, Jim, we have a little bit of reading to do, and I'll, I'll get in there and try and help you read as well. So, at, at, Mount, at Mount Sinai, in Leviticus chapter 26, there's this incredible passage about God, God's expectation of Israel to obey the Sabbath, to not violate his sanctuary, to refrain from idolatry. And he, he, he said very clearly in the first part of Leviticus 26 that if you do these things, you will prosper abundantly but if you don't and persist in not doing it i'm going to send war famine pestilence and plagues and if you persist i'll multiply that seven times over and even after that if you insist i'm going to drive you out yeah right that's what he said the next passage in that 
chapter that talks about the land says that God will give the land its Sabbaths. At the end of that process, he will bring Israel back and restore them. So in Leviticus chapter 26, 40 to 45 is where we see that. So maybe you can read that. I'm going to help you read some of this. Okay. It's too much reading. So let's read Leviticus 26, 40 to 45. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness which they committed against me and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. Or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they then make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land, for the land shall be abandoned by them and shall make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, shall be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinances and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God, but I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. So those are a few verses there that all reflect the simple reality that God will punish Israel heavily. I mean, he's going to punish them heavily. You know, to whom much is given, much is required. Israel is that nation that God has had appointed to be the vessel through which he will manifest himself to the nations. What an appointment. Well, their punishment was stiff. Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 40 that God will give them twice the punishment for their iniquity. But mm -hmm. their iniquity will eventually be removed. And so this is what Moses was saying at Mount Sinai. Now, you read the next block, and I'll read the rest of the scriptures, Jim. So in Deuteronomy chapter 30, 1 to 10. So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you, and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, in order that you may live. And the Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments which I command you today. Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly 
in all the work of your hand, in the offspring of your body and in the offspring of your cattle and in the produce of your ground. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, and soul. Now, you note know there that all of the verses that Jim read, thank you, Jim, that, 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 that was a lot of reading. It's not based on their acceptance of Jesus or not. Right. It's based on their obedience to Torah. Should they obey the law? Right. So much of Christianity takes the position that Israel has been, you know, banished, uh, punished because they didn't. They didn't accept Jesus at that appointed time, but that was not the appointed time. Mm -hmm. It was the appointed time for Jesus to be rejected by them and for him to go to the cross and become the Lamb of God. So what we saw there is that God said that I will circumcise their hearts, that it's an, it's an initiative that he himself will carry out. And what's the purpose of all of this? To bring them back and restore them based on what he said at Mount Sinai because he is going to be faithful to the covenant, to the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so what Jim just read there is exactly what we're seeing today, this, this period. So we're not at the end of it, so we can't expect to see all of the goodness that we want to see in Israel. Uh, Israel is still in a battle. They're still very much, it seems like, without faith, they're in the balance. Mm -hmm. But they're not. By faith, they're not in the balance. Those who have faith, and faith comes by the word. So, quite literally, the passage that Jim just read, all those verses, 10 verses, is the basis of our faith. We now can say we are absolutely convinced that God is in the process of bringing Israel to that platform, that 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 wonderful stage where he will present Israel to all the nations. He's doing that because the word says it. That's the basis for our faith. So we have faith. So we can look at what's happening in Israel today and say, well, we don't like what we're seeing. Would that God would have not allowed those six young people to be slaughtered? Uh, that would have been wonderful, but it happened. And so we have to believe, as Paul said in Romans chapter Eight, that all things work for good. Mm -hmm. You know, the souls of those six young people, uh, we would have loved to see them live on. But they belong to God. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, God is their creator and father. He decided that they would not live. And that's tough to, to deal with. But if you take a position of faith, you, you come to the conclusion that, well, they're secure. No, mm -hmm. they suffered for nine months, something almost, nine months almost. Mm -hmm. um, now it's up to Israel to make the right decisions based on what has happened. So we don't like what we see, but we know that these are some of the things that will occur. Now, Isaiah, concerning the reality of the restoration, I'm going to read the rest, Jim, because you did okay. a lot of reading. Okay. Isaiah now saw a time when God will bring Israel back the second time. And this second time has to do with what happened the first time, which is when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and took captivity, took Israel, well not Israel, Judah into captivity. But of course that was a partial captivity, it wasn't a complete captivity. Uh, and, and it lasted 75 years and then of course the ingathering process began according to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 24. So that was fulfilled. So that, that first ingathering, when God brought them back the first time, was tepid, was partial. What, what we're seeing here in Isaiah is that there's going to be a second ingathering. And this second ingathering has to do with the time of Messiah. All of chapter 11 of Isaiah is about the time of Messiah. It's, it's a messianic passage. It begins in chapter chapter 11, verse, I'm just going to read 1 and 2, just to illustrate that this is the Messianic period. Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a zemach 
from his root will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And the whole passage goes on like that, messianic. And then in verse 10, then in that day the nations will restore to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal, an ensign for the people, and his resting place will be glorious. So who is this root of Jesse? Of course, it's referring to the Zemach, as it said in verse 1. It's referring to Yeshua. But then, right at that time, it says in verse 11, Then, then, it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who remain from Assyria, <coughs> excuse me, Egypt, Patros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the, from the islands of the sea. So this is that ingathering. And this is the ingathering that we're seeing today. So we have to realize that this was long since prophesied. And it's happening. Is it complete? No. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's go, let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel had a picture of this restoration process as well, a vision that we'll read. So I want to read Ezekiel chapter 36, two, uh, 6 to 12. The point has already been made, but I want to, I want to bring these, these references. I want to be redundant about it. Right. Because we need to come to terms with the fact that God is pouring out his favor upon Israel now. The process is not complete. All right. So again, from a, from a faith standpoint, we absolutely we are absolutely convinced that it's going to be complete. From the standpoint of no faith, you look at it and you can question it. That's why this question is so relevant, because this person isn't looking at Israel from the standpoint of faith. This person is see, she's seen Israel from a natural point of view. So let's read here in, in chapter thirty six six to twelve. Now, Ezekiel chapter 36 is about the land of Israel, primarily. He does speak to the people, but he's speaking to the land of Israel. The literal terrain, the mountains, the hills, the streams. Let's read. <clears throat> Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains and to the hills, to the ravines and to the valleys, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my wrath, because you have endured the insults of the nations. Now remember, he's speaking to the land. Mm -hmm. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have sworn that surely the nations which are around you will themselves endure their insults. But you, O mountains of Israel, you will put forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people, Israel, for they will soon come. So we're in that process. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> We're in that process. Israel is not complete in the land of Israel, the people. The land is being prepared. The land is not complete. You go to Samaria, which is the northern part of, of that mountain range, and it's lush. You would mm -hmm. say it's complete, but it's not. Even in Judea, the, the greening of Judea is still occurring, so we're still in the process. We're not there yet. All right, let's read on. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you will be cultivated and sown. I will multiply men on you, all the house of Israel, all of it. So that's a very definitive mm -hmm. statement. Yes. He's going yes. to multiply all of the house of Israel on the land. And the cities will be inhabited, and the waste places will be rebuilt. <clears throat> I will multiply on you man and beast, and they will increase and be fruitful, and I will cause you to be inhabited as you were formerly. And I will treat you better than at first. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. So he's going to treat the land, even the people of course, better than at first. Yes, I will cause men, my people Israel, to walk on you and to possess you. So that you will become their nakala, their inheritance. And never again bereave them of children. That's... A very important statement. 
The land will never again. Is God wrong? Did he misspeak? Did he change his mind? No. No. He means it. The, the land will be the inheritance, the nakala of the people of Israel, a gift, an inheritance. And it will never bereave the people of their children again. This is that end gathering. That's where we are today. Now, the prophet Hosea had something to say in this regard as well. Concerning God's treatment of Israel better than at first. How did he treat Israel at first? He, he carried Israel. You know, he, he, he had them in his bosom. He brought them from Egypt. He had every intent to pour out every good thing upon them, to establish them as the head of the nations. It didn't quite happen, not because of him, but because of their lack of faith, their lack of obedience. Right. So he's brought Israel back to the land. And you know what? Overall, the nation of Israel is pursuant of obeying God. They keep the Sabbaths to the best of their capacity right now. They have a lot of weight on them. They have a lot of baggage, the nations primarily. So again, the process is not complete, but Israel is certainly in that direction. So They not only keep the Sabbath, yeah. they keep the seven-year Sabbath. Right. They keep the, the land Sabbaths, mm -hmm. the yeah. Jubilee yep. and mm -hmm. everything, yeah. So now, the prophet Hosea now is speaking to Israel again. And here, here we're going to see in Hosea chapter 2, 14 to 20. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. He will, you know, he will quote her, allure her, bring her. Bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her, referring to Israel, dispersed Israel. Then I will give her her vineyards from there. And the valley of Achor is a door of hope. And she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that, that you will call me Ishi. What is Ishi? Husband. husband. My husband. Ishi. My beloved. My husband. You will no longer call me Bali, my Lord. You will call me Ishi, my husband. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth so that they will no longer be mentioned by their names no more. In that day, I will also make a covenant for them with the beast of the field, with the birds of the sky, with the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, war, no more war, the sword and war from the land. And I will make them lie down in safety. I will betroll you to me forever. Yes, I will betroll you to me in righteousness and in justice, in love and kindness and in compassion. I will betroll you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. This is what Israel, the very nation of Israel that we see today, has in store for her. This is God's intent for Israel to pour out this goodness in the midst of Israel. Is there a struggle? Of course there's a struggle. Nothing good that God brings into existence comes without a struggle. That's elementary, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing that, that's established in faith comes into existence without monumental struggles. And that's what Israel is experiencing today. We who see this by faith, we don't like it. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed that these hostages would be released alive and six of them died and so we can't change it right but we don't like it we don't we don't like what we see but we know that this is par for the course i almost hate to use that cliche that statement but it is par for the course it is necessary that these things happen that that ultimately israel will come to that place of being firm in their resolution determined Yes. They're being tried. They're walking through the fire right mm -hmm. now. There's no yes. question about it. And from what I see, you know, this, this, this uprising in Israel, the protest, has a genesis that, that comes from outside of yes. Israel. Mm -hmm. It's being instigated. It's being financed. They're poking the flames here. But... By and large, the, po the population of Israel, the majority of Israel, once, as difficult as it is, 
wants the Israeli government, the IDF, the Sinbad, to continue what they're doing, to carry this out. Do it quickly, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Destroy Hamas, you know, win the war. Israel cannot afford to, quote unquote, lose the war, right? Even though, even though Hamas has been depleted, um, you know, Hamas is in shambles. Gaza is decimated. So how can Israel lose that war? Well, it is a, it is a war of opinion, right? It's a, it's a war of attrition at this point, unfortunately, but it's a war of opinions. And you have the world media forming opinions. So what has to happen is there has to be a, a clear and decisive victory. So clear, so, device, so, so decisive that the world media cannot spin it. Right. And the Hamas can never walk away saying we won the war. That has to happen. And that's going to be brutal. Israel has to crush Hamas. Right. Destroy Hamas completely. There's still enough of Hamas's organization intact to hold on to another 100 hostages. Yeah, it's a war of attrition. Hamas wants to, to, to position themselves and to force Israel into some sort of a deal, have the nations of the world apply all kinds of pressure on, Hamas, on, on Israel so they can declare victory. And what does that do? Bring them closer to the point of carrying out what happened on October 7th, but much more grandiose on a much larger scale. That's their, that's their stated objective. Yes. So Israel cannot afford to capitulate, not at this point. Then the lives of those six young people would have been offered up in vain. Right. right. Exactly. Right. And, and Israel can't do it. When, so When I had revelation in the Lord, part of that revelation was the viciousness of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Israel needs to face up to the viciousness of their enemy, yes. whose Lord is the same vicious one. Mm -hmm. They know it, but they have a secondary enemy or maybe a primary enemy that is bending their arm. Right. That primary enemy is this global order. Mm -hmm. uh, the EU, you know, you talked about England not wanting to, to provide arms for Israel. Uh, Biden applying pressure on Bibi Netanyahu. Um, that's that's their primary enemy. Yeah. I would say Hamas and all of Islam is their secondary enemy. All right, they're, they're being used by this world order. You know, it was it was Barack Hussein Obama that said that it's, that, he, that they were looking forward to the reestablishment of the Levant. Right. And the Levant does not include Israel as a sovereign nope. state. So this is the purpose of the globalists, to arrange things in the world in such a way that Israel does not have a state. Ultimately, what does that, what does that mean for the Jewish population in, in the land of Israel today? Complete assimilation. Well, I don't, <coughs> think, I don't think that there would be assimilation. I think they would kill them. Well, or completely assimilate them. You know, if you completely simulate them, what, they have what's no the identity difference? any longer. <clears throat> Many Arabs are actually Jewish. Yes. In their descendancy, but means nothing. Omar Gaddafi, remember him? Mm -hmm, yeah. He was Jewish. So, so it, it's 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 in a place right now where the only solution is the reality that Israel has no choice. Golda Meir said it right. She said it. Mm -hmm. We have a secret weapon. We have no choice. Right. And this is where Israel is today. And of course, geopolitics and our government would put pressure on Israel and, and give them a choice. Well, Israel has no choice. Right. So if you look at Israel with natural eyes and you try to appraise what's happening there now, even currently, from the standpoint of, of a natural viewpoint, you're going to come up with all kinds of questions and conclusions that are separate from a faith point of view. You see Israel by faith, Israel is prospering. I mean, is that clear? Can't you, I mean, mm -hmm. you guys, can't yeah. you see that? I mean, been there, right? Right. <clears throat> Where, remember the border between Jordan and Israel, and the Israeli side was lush and green and beautiful, and the Jordanian side was desert? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We stood on on the hilltop of uh, in in uh, t around Tekoa, mm -hmm. 
you know, right. at, the, at the top of the the uh, top of that hill, and we looked around, looked at the ground be below us and around us, and it was green. It wasn't like the Chamron, mm -hmm. but it was it, green. It had never been green in previous right. trips that we yes. had done. Mm -hmm. It was green. It was desert. And then we looked directly across the Dead Sea, literally eastward, mm -hmm. right. same latitudinal line, and it's barren. Right. Well, it's absolutely barren. So the evidence that the land of Israel is blossoming beyond the surrounding lands is right there. It's happening right there. Is the, is it, is the process complete? No. no. Mm -mm. And so I'll, I'll appeal to our Christian friends. If you want to see Israel the way the Bible portrays Israel, which of course is how God would see Israel, then see Israel through the lens of the Bible. See Israel through eyes of faith. The word of God is the basis for our faith. The Bible is brimming with references, like such as what we read, concerning the period of time that we're in. We're in the time of the restoration. If you see Israel through that prism, you're not going to have questions such as this one. You will come to terms with the reality that the land of Israel is being prepared for the people of Israel. Your doctrinal conundrum about Israel will fade away because the word of God is the truth and the truth in this in this context and in every other context will set you free when it's clear and obvious and you embrace it it becomes faith it's the only way for us to view Israel well that's our program it's these questions that we address raise other questions in your thinking please share them with us the easiest way to do that is to email us at voice at buildupzion.org again that's voice at buildupzion.org and until next week shalom shalom, shalom.